Well, good morning, church. It's always interesting to me to hear this buzz of fellowship that takes place on a Sabbath morning. And so I have the privilege to welcome you to Sunnyside. I'm so glad that you have chosen to be here. And I'm delighted at this time of the year with the colors that start emerging all around us as crocus and uh, daffodils start emerging in our gardens and in the church garden. It's very special, the color and shape that they bring. And it reminds me that God has given us all a special time to show a smiling face and who we are and the uniqueness of the beauty of Jesus in our faces as we meet with one another on a Sabbath morning. And I thank you for bringing that specialness to our church family this morning. We are delighted to have you. If you are visiting Sunnyside this morning, thank you for choosing to be here. And we ask God's blessing on your experience here with us this morning. I want to refer you to the bulletin, if you would open it, you will find on the right-hand center spread uh, a number of programs I just want to alert you to. This afternoon at 4 p.m., his praise will be with us, and it's a good opportunity to celebrate with a special kind of men's chorus praise to God. Tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., we pay tribute to a very special person who has belonged to Sunnyside and we belong to him for a number of years. And a number of you are here also visiting to also attend Mel's uh, memorial service tomorrow. I want to alert you to the fact that the service actually will begin at 10.30. The format of the service is a little different to the normal kind of memorial service. Very appropriately, the family has chosen to use the format of an even song, even though it's even in, at 11 o'clock in the morning. And this even song is so appropriately associated with Mal West, and you will understand as we celebrate his life and pay tribute to him tomorrow morning. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, I remind you that Sunnyside Symphony is going to be here. I had the privilege of just peeking in during the week, one night this week, and I want to tell you the music is absolutely amazing. Very, very special, and we are fortunate, very blessed, to be able to have this kind of ministry in our own church here and have it so frequently. <laughs> For Sunnyside members, we invite you also on Wednesday night to our business meeting. It's a regular business meeting, a time to reflect on the ministries of the church and also to look ahead at where we are going. And we thank you for your participation. As we begin our church service this morning, I would like to invite you just to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for the richness of the colors and shapes and forms that we bring when we come to church. Thank you that the beauty of Jesus is seen on each of our faces. And thank you that we reflect your rich, deep grace as we worship you, as we praise together. And we pray that as your word is sung, played, prayed, and preached today that our lives will be different because we've met Jesus in this place. We pray in his name, amen.
Good morning. Our hymn of preparation this morning is 290, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, hymn 290. worship this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalms 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 10. Come, Christians, join to sing. Stand with me and let's sing together.
Please kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning in amazement of how great you are. You control the heavens above and the earth below. You care for the smallest animals and you care for us. We thank you for the many wonderful things you provided for us each and every day. This morning we lift up the sick and hurting in our church family and community. We pray for healing upon the ill and comfort upon those who grieve. Lord, the beginner Sabbath school is starting their lesson on Noah this week. Help them to find the story of the flood to be exciting, and may they experience the story in a way that resonates with each one of them for years to come. Help the beginners to feel your love and protection in their lives. We lift up those in China who are sick and have lost loved ones. Lord, we have faith that you will make something good come of this outbreak. Help doors and minds to be opened so that your truth can spread to all of China. May we all live to spread your truth throughout the world is our prayer this morning. Amen. The offering this morning is for church budget. Thank you, Tapu, for playing for us this morning. And she's one of my favorite camp meeting volunteers. 
Just had to add that in. Camp meetings are coming. All right. So I got strict instructions from Brenda this morning to ask you to please pass this down the row so that it's easy for the kids to pick up this morning. And this offering will go for the kids going to church school. Thank you. It's important for everybody to find a comfortable place to sit where you can see. So let's just wait a few more seconds while everybody comes up. And let me just ask you, did, who celebrated Valentine's Day yesterday? Did you? Did you send some cards to friends? Maybe to mommy and daddy? That's all good. Good. All right, we almost settled. So, on the way to church this morning, did any of you see any signs on the way? Yes. What sign did you see? No signs. All right, I'll show you one that you saw. Ah, oh, yes, you saw a stop sign. Did you? Or were you just dreaming in the back? <laughs> All right. Um, if you look around the church, you can see another sign. Oh, yes. Somebody was listening last week about the angels. All right. The, you saw can you see it? There's one here behind me. I can see one, two, three, and the lights are all on. Isn't that wonderful? So that's another kind of a sign that gives you information, right? This one you have to obey when you are driving. This one tells you something that you need to know, where to leave the church when you need to leave. All right. I've got some other signs with me this morning. Some signs may be that God shows us at different times. This is one of the first ones that come out in our garden. Whoops. What is that? What flower is that? It's a crocus. Crocuses come out right at the beginning when we know spring is just around the corner. And then we get these daffodils. I looked at the daffodils in the church this morning. Yes, there's some coming. And then we've got these beautiful little ones. Aren't they dainty and sweet? Another sign. What is that? Do you know what that's called? A snowdrop. It's a snowdrop, you're right, it's a snowdrop. 
and this one's got a funny name. But this one here that's got its head kind of bent down a little bit. It's got such a pretty little face. It's called a Helleborus. A Helleborus. I, th I remember it by saying, hello, Boris. Because I'm not really good with names of these. And this one I can remember. If you smell these flowers, the, f the smell that you're smelling is a smell from this plant here, this woody one. And this one is called a Daphne. And the reason I remember that is because it was my mother-in-law's name. So we used to look forward to the Daphne's coming out. So these are all signs, signs of what? Do you know what these are signs of? Spring, spring is just around the corner. Not quite, quite here, but this is a reminder. I checked outside this morning to see if any of our trees had got leaves yet, the ones that lose their leaves. I didn't see any. So why am I telling you about signs today? This is a sign that reminds us how much God loves us, right? God loves us very much. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, God loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us forever and ever. And sometimes we see signs around us that remind us of a very special time when Jesus is coming back to visit with us and to take us to be home with him. Do you know what, what we call that? Jesus, when Jesus comes back, we call it his second coming. Remember the first time he came as a baby? The second time he's coming to get us. So as we see signs of special things happening, like spring being just around the corner, that's going to remind us of the time when God, who loves us forever and ever and ever, is going to come and take us to go and live with him. That will be a happy day. Thank you for listening to the story. Let's just have a prayer before we go. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the signs of spring that remind us of your love. And thank you that as we see the signs that you give us, we can remember that you are coming back very soon to take us to be with you in heaven. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening.
Today we're going to look at Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, which is my personal one, but you could use the one in the pew as well. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with the voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out, conquering and to conquer. Well, the music, the stories, the prayer. I love, it that, I love it that you prayed for our little ones and their understanding. I don't know how often we do that, but thank you for that, Ed. That was really, really nice. And uh, you must have prayed enough for our lights because they're not blinking. <laughs> Appreciate that. Couple of things. Uh, one that I just wanted to uh, clue you in on. In uh, 2021, late April into early May, I'm bringing whoever wants to go on a trip to Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. Um, cost money. But uh, if you want to go, if you're interested, uh, my wife and I are going to be hosting it. And we've got a lot of people that are already wanting to go and signing up for it. But if you want to go, just let me know and I'll send you an email with all of the uh, specs on it and everything like that. A lot of walking. Uh, when we went to Petra last time, I think I walked 12 miles and a lot of it was going up and down and up and down. But uh, you're invited if you'd like to go. Another thing, after the sermon, if you want, I'm going to put this right on the front pew. Uh, there is a, a handout talking about some of the things that I'm going to be referring to today that, that compare actually uh, the seven seals in Matthew chapter 24, and I'm just going to put that right up here. It's front and back, only one page, so I'll just leave that right here for you if you want that. Okay, Revelation chapter 6, the seven seals, the four horsemen. Let's start by talking about symbolism for a moment, can we? Uh, the four horsemen, oh, I gotta turn this on before I do that, there we go. The four horsemen are symbols. There are not going to be four real horses that look something like this that are gonna break through the stratosphere and march all over the earth doing what these things are doing. These are all symbols, in fact, the Bible is, uh, uh, is a symbolic book a lot of the time, but the book of Revelation specifically has a lot of symbology in it. There's symbol after symbol after symbol. And I want to talk about those symbols for a moment. The first thing I want to talk about is that these symbols are rooted in the book of, of Revelation in the sanctuary. If you understand the Old Testament sanctuary and how it was set up, you're better going to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to recognize some things. Revelation 4, let's just read through this for a second and we'll talk about some of these symbols. After this I looked and there were before me a door standing open in heaven. The voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. I like that. He was in the Spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with something sitting on it. Interesting. There's a throne in heaven with something sitting on it. This, uh, this already starts us out in the most holy place of the sanctuary. A throne with something sitting on it. Notice it doesn't say with somebody, with someone. Something. Now we're going to get to the someone, but at first he looks and he goes, oh, oh, someone it says. I'm sorry, someone sitting on it. And the reason I'm saying that is this. And just earlier today, I had some uh, young people in my office and one of them said, when you think of God, what do you think? What's the picture that comes into your head? Right? And if I was to ask you, what, what would uh, uh, somebody with long gray hair and a long gray beard maybe is that when you think of God the Father, what you think of? Yeah? 
I don't know what your picture of God is. It's, it's uh, um, one of the people in the room said, I think of God more in female terms. I, I, I think of female characteristics when I think of God. I said, oh, great. The Bible does have plenty of places in it that it refers to, to God in that kind of a way. Um, um, I don't know that I have a gender when I think of God. I do refer to him as he because I'm used to that. I've been conditioned to think that, but I don't know that I think of a, a gender. But look at, what, look at what John sees. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns on their heads. The jasper and carnelian, these are colors of blood. When you look at them, uh, when you Google image, jasper and carnelian, it's the color of blood. He sees not a person, he sees color. John sees color. Whoever it is is color, and it's blood. And I think there's a reason for that. Again, if you know anything about the Old, Te Old Testament sanctuary, there was a lot of blood everywhere, right? But specifically, the blood that is on the mercy seat or the blood that, that is on the person on the mercy seat, that's going to come into play here in just a second. But look at this other part. The 24 other thrones were seated on them were 24 elders. It's surrounded by these 24. So if you look at um, what we think it looked like um, out in the Old Testament in the, in the wilderness in the with the sanctuary model, what you have is you have the sanctuary inside of these walls, and we'll get to the parts of the sanctuary here in a second. And then around the sanctuary, you have the Israelites. The closest tents to the sanctuary, and this is not a good replica of that, was a third of a mile away. So if you wanted to walk to the sanctuary to sacrifice a lamb, let's say, for a sin that you did or to give a thank offering for something. You had to walk at least a third of a mile with that lamb on your shoulders to get there. The closest divisions of uh, all the 12 tribes of Israel surrounding the sanctuary were the Levites. The Levites were the front tents guarding the sanctuary. And guess how many divisions of the Levites there were? 24. John gives you a sanctuary typology here. There's 24 divisions of the Levites, and so uh, surrounding the throne, surrounding the sanctuary here in heaven, you have 24. And then you look inside the sanctuary, right? And you see an ark. You see in the most holy place, you see an altar of incense, the table of showbread, the candlesticks, the laver, the altar of burnt offering. All of these pieces of furniture are found in the book of Revelation. John roots the whole idea of Revelation in the sanctuary. The more you know about the sanctuary, the more you will know about the book of Revelation. And then, John sees these four creatures that are surrounding the, uh, the sanctuary. Let's read it in Revelation 4, 5 through 11. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peelings of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. There you see the seven lamp stand, the, the lamp stand there. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. This is uh, talking about the laver where the priest would wash his hands with the water in it as you would come in and sacrifice, Okay. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. And these are weird-looking creatures. Let's check this out. They were covered with eyeballs front and back. Front and back. I told you last week, I think these angels were probably mothers because mothers have those eyes in the back of their head. They always know what your kids are doing, right? The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. That would be uncomfortable, but this is all symbol, right? He's not, this is not a literal thing flying around heaven. This is all symbolizing something else, okay? What could it be symbolizing? So uh, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel sees something very similar in the sanctuary, there's a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. Where is this coming from? Again, it goes back to the sanctuary. If you look at the, at the sanctuary, I'm going to use the laser here. Let's see if you can see it. 
right there, right there, right here, and right here, you're going to have four different banners. Each of the 12 tribes had a banner with a symbol on the banner that represented their tribe. The tribe of Judah would be the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So all of them had their... Guess what four symbols were posted at each corner in the wilderness around the sanctuary? It was the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. John, again, is using sanctuary language to say, this is where I've been brought in. I've been brought into the presence of God in this sanctuary in heaven. Now, do I think it has dimensions like we know dimensions? Do I, do I think you can measure it with a tape measure? I don't know, maybe. I'm guessing that the dimensions in heaven act a lot weirder than the dimensions that we have here on earth. I mean, we do three dimensions pretty well, right? But the dimensions in heaven, like when you read about the, uh, the new earth and the new Jerusalem, it's kind of made into a cube and everybody's going to live in on different parts of the cube and I don't know how that all works. The dimensions in heaven are all wonky. I mean, they're, they're fine, but it, they're all wonky to me. So for sure, the first thing I want you to know is the book of Revelation is couched in sanctuary language. The next thing I want you to know is that when it comes to the four horsemen, there's a prophetic precedent to who the four, four horsemen can be interpreted as being. And this is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. And during the night I had a vision, and there was before me a man riding a red horse, a colored horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. I asked, what are these, my Lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. I want you to understand that there's a prophetic precedent to say, I'm going to use men on horses to go throughout the earth and do what I'm asking them to do. Okay? Okay. That's all I want you to take from this. You can probably read a thousand times deeper into it. The only thing I want you to take from it right now is there's a prophetic precedence where God says, I'm going to use a man on a horse to go throughout the earth and do my bidding. Okay? You got that? Just simple, right? Okay. Let's go into one more realm of the sanctuary. When we get into chapter 5 of Revelation, we see something different. John is standing in the sanctuary. He's looking at the throne. The throne is covered in something that looks like blood. And that person that has blood all over them or that is the color of blood or that looks like blood, something else stands up next to John in, in, in chapter 5. And this really takes him. Now, I'm going to ask, how many of you grew up on a farm or around a farm? Anybody? You did? Bo, you did? Have you ever seen an animal being slaughtered? Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think it would be horrible. Um, my wife would think even more horribler. Is that a word? Yeah. So I've seen an animal slaughtered. It was when we lived in British Columbia in Bella Coola. There was a farmer there, and he invited me over to watch, me, uh, watch him slaughter an animal. And I'm not going to get way graphic for everybody, but I'm going to get enough so that you get the idea. This animal was upside down, okay, hanging by its legs, and it was alive. And I don't know if this is how you're supposed to do it. And he walked up to the animal with a very sharp knife, and he slit its throat. And I'm standing there and watching this. I'd never seen anything this brutal in my life. And at the time, I was not a vegetarian. I quickly started reevaluating my life. <laughs> and I watched this thing bleed out, and then I watched him slaughter the animal to get it ready for food. So he had to bleed it out, he had to open it up. He had to take all of its guts out so that that's all that was left. And then finally he had the last part was taking the skin off. I don't know if it was the last part, but it was a part of it. I watched him do all of this and I thought, ooh, slaughtered animals are shocking and ugly. 
in Revelation chapter 5, standing next to the blood-looking person on the throne is a slaughtered lamb. Not pretty, but it's a slaughtered lamb. And to make it even weirder, it's got seven horns. You've seen the rams with the, or the lambs with the, you got seven horns and seven eyeballs. Well, you know that the, word, the, the number seven in the Bible denotes perfection, right? It has perfect power and perfect wisdom and vision. It sees everything that's going on in the world and has perfect power to do something about it. And at the beginning of the seven seals, we see how that's all going to work out. Now, holding uh, the, the, the slaughter lamb has in its right hand, the right hand is what? It's a seat of power. If, you're, if I'm on my throne and you're sitting at my right hand side, that says something very important about you. The right hand is power. In my right hand, in his right hand, in the lamb's right hand, is a scroll and it's written on front and back. Here we are, the mercy seat of God in the Holy of Holies is Jesus on the Ark of the Covenant. He's sitting on his throne, the mercy seat, and he's got a, a scroll front and back. Again, another allusion to the sanctuary because in the, in the desert, in the mercy seat, what was, what was in the mercy seat? It was a, not a scroll, but tablets of stone written on front and back that inscribed the very character of God. Jesus stands there holding the very character of God. You want to know who God is? He looks just like me. Jesus. So now, we have this, all of this imagery, and then something happens. For you to understand what happens next, I want you to turn your Bibles. If there's a Bible in front of you, you can grab it or you can get it on your phone to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read for a second. Read with me and you'll be able to pay attention. If you just sit there and listen to me, you're going to fall asleep. I know how it works. Breakfast is brewing and you're thinking about lunch. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he told them, do you see all these buildings? I assure you, they will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. If I told you and you believed me that in the near future, Sunnyside Church was going to be so utterly destroyed that you wouldn't be able to recognize it. That, that the beams would be down, that the, that the bricks would all fall down, the glass would be broken, the pews would be demolished. If I told you this is going to happen very, very soon, you'd probably want to know what's going on, right? Right? I mean, if I just whispered to you in the corner, Pastor Cara, Pastor Shirley, I, <clears throat> I've heard something recently, and this whole church is going down like a big explosion is going to happen. And then I walked away. Would you maybe want to ask me a question? <laughs> like, can I get the stuff out of my office first? <laughs> right? Jesus says to the disciples, this beautiful temple, the, the anchor of our religion, the anchor of our economy in Jerusalem, the anchor of everything we do is going to be utterly destroyed, he says. Well, this is going to raise an eyebrow. So Jesus tells them this, and they walk from, and if you go on the tour with me, you're going to walk this road, they walk from the Mount of Olives down into the Kidron Valley, and or, I'm sorry, they walk from the temple down into the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, 
And this is not a, a short little walk. I mean, they, they, they did some walking and they got up there and when they're sitting around on the Mount of Olives, they're still thinking about these words. What do you mean they're going to destroy the temple? Who's going to destroy the temple? How is this going to happen? And finally, they can't stand it any longer. They're sitting there and they say, okay, okay, we give. <laughs> Tell us, what's going to happen? What's going to when is all this going to happen? We're freaking out here. I mean, this is going to this is going to mean everything's going to change. There's going to be a time of trouble. There's going to be I mean, we, we need to be afraid. We need to be prepared. Come on, Jesus, give us some give us something here. And in Matthew 24, Jesus does. Jesus told them in verse 4, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah. They will lead many astray and wars will break out near and far, but don't panic. Yes, these things must come, but the end won't come immediately. Nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all of this will only be the beginning of the horrors to come. The horrors to come. Then you'll be arrested and persecuted and killed and you'll be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and, and lead many people astray. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But, these, but those who endure to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then finally, the end will come. And Jesus goes on and on, all the way through 24, describing things about the second coming as lightning is from east to the west, and some people will be taken and some people will be left, and there's all kinds of things that he says. But basically what Jesus is doing is he's laying out things to be aware of as we get closer and closer to the end of time. The end of time is a theme all the way through the Bible. There were lots of ends of times, by the way. Did you know that? First time there was an end of time, a flood happened. <laughs> started all over with the new earth. And for Israel, it happened in Egypt too. They were persecuted and time of trouble happened and they were released into the promised land, right? And then in Babylon, they were in captivity again and finally they were released back into the promised land of Jerusalem. And now Jesus is talking about kind of two things, what's going to happen to Jerusalem, but more than that, what's going to happen to the whole world. And he said, here's your warnings. The seven seals in the book of Revelation are Matthew 24 in apocalyptic language. That's all they are. I told you at the beginning of the series, we're not going to learn anything in Revelation that Jesus didn't already teach us. This is what is done. And I have on that paper the parallels all the way through. What happens in, 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 the, in the, the great apocalyptic literature here, and go ahead and look at it, Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to read it in apocalyptic language. The same thing I just read from Jesus, I'm going to read in apocalyptic language, which is symbolic and very, very frightening. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then one of the four living beings called out with a voice that sounded like thunder, Come! And I looked up and I saw a white horse. Its rider carried a bow and a crown and was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain victory. Then the lamb broke the second seal, and the second living being said, Come! And another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given mighty sword and the authority to remove peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. Then the lamb broke the third seal, third seal and I heard the living being say, Come! And I looked up and I saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand, a voice from among the four living beings said, A loaf of, of uh, wheat bread or three loaves of barley for, one, for a day's pay. That seems like a lot. And don't waste the olive oil and the wine. Talking about famine and a shortage of food. Verse 7. And when the, Lord, when the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come! And I looked and I saw a horse whose color was pale green, like a corpse. Ew. And death was the name of its rider, who was followed by the, uh, around by the grave. And they were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. And then there's a fifth seal and the sixth seal and the seventh seal. What I want you to see is this. 
The seven seals in Matthew 24. And again, I have a handout that explains it a little bit better right here. The white horse is given authority, but misleads the people of God. And there's warfare and famine and death and martyrdom and heavenly signs and second coming. Matthew 24 and the seven seals parallel each other all the way down. What I'd like to do is I would like you to understand why this is important. This is just Bible theology nerd knowledge stuff right here, okay? But I want, to know, I want you to know why I think it's important. And it all starts in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, there's a war. Starts in heaven, and it's not a war that goes pew, 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 pew. It's a war of words. It's a war of ideas. Polemos. Mudslinging. It's one group of people saying, God is this. And another group of people saying, no, 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 no. That's not God. God's like this. The war in heaven got so intense that God had to end it and say, listen, you can't be in heaven and act like that anymore. And Lucifer and a third of the angels get dropped out of heaven and the war comes to earth. It goes from heaven to earth. And now the war is playing out in front of a tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent, the dragon in that tree, plants some things in Eve's brain, in Adam's brain, that have trickled down through history and still linger in our brains today. Can God be trusted? Is he a liar? Is somehow God holding out on me? What kind of, who died and made him God? The result of this deception at the tree changed the human psyche in how they view God. And it happened right away. That very day, Jesus is walking in the cool of the day. He's in the garden. Every day be before that, he would come to the garden. Adam, Eve, Adam would, and Eve would come running up to their Savior and throw their arms around him. Oh, Jesus, my best friend. Hey, you know what happened today, Jesus? Oh, it was so cool. We were walking along, and you know that real tall one with the splotches on it that eats the trees from the leaves? We named it a giraffe. And Jesus smiles. Oh, man, that's great that you named him a giraffe. Oh, oh, and Jesus, that one that plays around in the water and everything, with his, we named it an otter. And Jesus laughed. Oh, that's okay. We'll call it an otter. You get to pick. And then they probably, and Jesus, what happened with the platypus? Did you just have a bunch of different parts left over and made an animal out of it? No, oh, no, no. I got a special purpose for the platypus. Got to give... Australian something to be proud of. I'm just kidding. <laughs> every day Jesus would show up and every day his kids would run into his arms. And on this day, Jesus comes into the garden. Adam! Eve, where are you? Nothing. Adam, Eve, I'm here for our walk. Tell me what you named today. <clears throat> um, we're over here. Where? Uh, uh, behind this bush. Well, why are you hiding behind a bush? We're naked. For the first time in the universe, somebody experienced shame. Shame. And along with shame always comes fear. We're naked and, and we're, we're afraid. Parents, moms, dads, can you imagine what it would do to your heart if when you walked into your home after a long day's work and you wanted to just play with your kids, you couldn't wait to see them, you walk in and they look at you and they go, oh no, oh no, dad, 
dad's home. Run, run, dad's home. And they just in terror ran from you and, and hid. Can you imagine what this did to the heart of God? I had to crush him. You're afraid? Why were they afraid of God? Had anything changed about God? Had, did Jesus come into the garden that day a different person? I mean, did he come in and go, Adam, Eve, where are you? I know what you did. Adam, Eve, well, tell, me, tell me what you did to name the animals today. Adam and Eve were afraid of God and that fear that they had of God and that, that mixed up notion of who God is is what's happening in Revelation 12. The dragon, the Bible says, was bent to deceive the whole world. About what? About God. He wants to twist humanity to the point where when we think of God, we don't have clear thoughts about him. We give him attributes that would more belong to the dragon than to the Father. And I tell you this because the sixth seal, the sixth seal breaks my heart. The sixth seal describes the second coming in apocalyptic terms. And look at what happens. Look at what God's own kids cry out. They cry out to the rocks and on the mountains. Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the baby sheep. I mean, I, I know some of you were on farms when you saw a little baby lamb frolicking around and jumping and chasing a butterfly and going, nah. Did you scream in horror and run, watch out, the baby sheep is out. Oh no, it's going to destroy everything. I remember when I took my, my little boy to a petting zoo once, and, and he, he was four, I think, year, years old, and we went to this petting zoo in Wenatchee, and there was a little baby lamb there, and he just couldn't help. Jesus was sinking his, his fingers into the wool. Oh, Dad, this is so cool. He's so wonderful. Somehow along the way, we got afraid of the wrath of the baby sheep. The four horsemen, this might hurt to hear, are the church. The white horse, the first one, is the church. I'm going to go back to the picture. That first horse is what Jesus was describing. They're going to come in my name. And, and what was the job of the church? To go out and represent the character of God to say, hey, this is what God is like. It's given a crown of authority. But look at what it's picked up also. A bow and arrow, a sword, implements of war. If you don't believe like we say you should believe, we will use intimidation, we will use force, we will kill you. The four horsemen are the church going from bad to worse to worse to worse. It's a description of a period of history on this world, on this earth. 1260 years where the church united with governments and the church, they, they did anything they wanted to. They could say, you're a king or you're not a king. Um, you're, to, you're, you're deposed, we're going to replace you. They made laws. And if you disagreed with the church and their theology, what happened to you? If you stood up and said, oh yeah, I don't believe that. You were burned at the stake. There was a group called Anabaptists that said, we disagree with the church that you should baptize these babies. You should wait till you're an adult. You know how the church killed them? Took them out into a lake, tied rocks around their feet, and dumped them in the water and said, if you believe in adult baptism, we'll baptize you. 
Killed thousands and thousands of Anabaptists that way. The church used force and intimidation. They warped the picture of God through theology as just reprehensible. They taught things like, if you don't like God or if you don't do what we say, if you're not a part of our church, then when you die, you're going to go to hell and you're going to stay there forever and you're never going to die because God won't let you because that's the kind of God he is. Taught things like, God's not accessible. You got to come to us first. So if you want to get forgiveness, you go to a priest and say, uh, here's my sins. And the priest says, okay, well, let me talk to, uh, hey, Mary, um, they want to get forgiven. And Mary says to Jesus, listen, I am your mother. You need to forgive that person. And Jesus goes to the father and says, listen, mom wants me to have you forgive that person. And say you're our fathers, you get forgiven. Instead of what the Bible says, that we can boldly approach the throne of, throne of grace and say, listen, I did this and I'm sorry. And God's saying, oh man, I forgave you before you even came. There's this, there's this chasm they created. And it's gotten into our language. If something bad did happen to the church, you know what the, inform, the, the insurance form would say? It was an act of God. The devil has used the church to twist the character of God so that we give attributes to God that only belong to the devil. And this is not who God is. Let me ask you, what is your picture of God? I, I still know I have things to work out. I'll be driving to a church appointment and I'll be running a little late and I'll hit every stop sign or stoplight red. I'll get behind um, somebody that, that is going 20 miles an hour under the speed limit, and, and my patience will be tried. And you know what my you know what my first thought is? Why are you doing this to me? And I'm a pastor. Little superstitions. See, that's not who God is. Let me show you who God is. When Jesus cleared out the temple with the whip, kicked over some tables, remember that? Scary story. If you ever read Ellen White's description of this in Desire of Ages, it'll blow your mind. He goes in there and the people that were acting like the devil were afraid. They were afraid of him, and good reason. She says he stood up to his full stature and, and he looked a little different. <laughs> Right after the tables are over and the animals are free, right after that, she turns the camera right over to Jesus. And there's these kids sitting on his lap, leaning on his breast, she says, as he holds them and tells them stories about the kingdom of God. The cowards, the people that had a, a, a wrong idea of God, the people that were manipulating religion to take advantage of people, they were terrified. They ran. They cried for the mountains to, call, to fall on them. But those who loved Jesus, those who were like children, gathered around him and basked in his presence. The seven seals are the story of how the church went wrong. And as these seals are being unlocked, Instead of looking at all the horror that you're seeing that the church is bringing onto the world, the call is to look back at the lamb that's on the throne and take confidence that you're always safe with him. I, there's a lot of people that get afraid when they talk about the end of time. The Bible says 365 times, fear not. And one of them times it says, for I am with thee. If you hide yourself in Jesus, if you become like a little child, like Jesus suggested, there is no fear in the book of Revelation. There's only peace and safety and goodness for you.
Let's sing about that safe place. A mighty fortress is our God. Hymn 506. So the hymn says that when we are being assaulted by the evil one, when the world is falling apart, when times of trouble are so heavy on us, we don't know where to turn. It says one little word shall fell the enemy. What is that one little word? Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. 
get as close as you can to Jesus, and though the world fall apart, the hell break loose, you're going to be safe because he's going to be in the boat with you during the storm. When it comes to the second coming, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know how to get ready for it, get close to Jesus. When you're close to Jesus, you are safe. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, we see things happening around our world and we wonder how long. But as we wonder, Lord, we can have confidence that we need not fear because the Lamb is coming to the rescue. Lord, help us to grab hold of Jesus and to hold him so close that people will maybe have a hard time figuring out who's who. Lord, live in our hearts. Take our lives and let them be. Thank you, Jesus, for a way out. And thank you for being our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.